Yeah, I mean, it's the value of I mean, I of think I feel lessons. connected to you like I feel connected with Quincy. When I met Quincy here in some arrangements I did for Saruman, and he just happened to be walking by the, the booth, you know, when they're mixing down the voices. This is how you met Quincy. Yeah. Well, I hadn't met him yet. I mean, I wasn't there. They were mixing down my arrangements. But you, you were there during the mixing? No. Oh, he just heard it. No, that's so what I'm saying. he met you through your music. Complete, that's the point. He's walking down at Record Plant, and you know, when, when we're in the studio, I love what Bruce Finney always said, can we make it too hot in here? Can we make it too cold in here? You know, that was the way it was in the studio. So they happened to have the door open so they could get some air while they're mixing the voices. Quincy poke, pokes his head in and says, Whose arrangements are those? They said Tommy Baylor, and he said, "Hmm, doesn't ring a bell." How do I? How do I reach him? They said, "Well, he's with Arlen's." He said, "Oh, so am I." So I'm doing a date at Western. That's the answering service. Yes, the answering service, which we all lived on then. And you had a little beeper, right? Was that how nope. they reached you? No, nope. they, they call, would. You no, call in. No, then. they were. There were phones on the wall with no dials. So you'd call in. What you do is just pick it up. And they would say, Arlen, hi, this is Tommy Baylor. Oh yeah, we have a thing for you. But what they would also do, if, if you were in a session and somebody called for you, they would write it down and put a paper. Wait a minute, the, the studios had phones, Arlen's phones? Every one of studio. So I'm Arlen's not... answering service had phones with no dials. Yes. And you just pick it up and you can check in to see who's reaching. Exactly, and it was just, it was <laughs> all the dope. studios. Any studio that was anybody, but it wasn't just Arlen's. It was Arlen's. There was Call Nina, which was the very first one. That was the singers. It was a black phone. Arlen's was a yellow phone. And then there was like gir you, Your Girl or something like that was a blue phone. And, um, and that's the way we kept. So we would give Arlen's number as our phone number. They would call and I said, uh, we have a job for Tom Baylor. They said, great, we'll get it to him right away. And so that's why they would do it so I could accept, we could accept the job. So I get this call. I, I'm in the, and we're singing and we're getting ready to take a break. They gave me this thing that says, please call all Arlen's right away. And I think, ooh. So I get on the phone. I said, hi, Tom Baylor. Um, uh, they said, oh, Quincy Jones is trying to reach you. And I said, well, please put him on. <laughs> so he gets on the phone and he goes, hey, man, I heard some charts you did. I love them. Uh, you did them for Sassy. I'm getting ready to do a new album. I'd like to work with you. Simple as that. And I said, I would like to work with you. And he said, well, what are you doing after this gig? I said, I'm headed to your house. Yeah. All I needed is an address. So I drove out to his house. <clears throat> he was in a rental home there in Brentwood Park. Beautiful home. Anyway, I had a glass front door. Mm -hmm. So I knock on the door, and there's quite a, quite a, a hall. And he's walking down on a runner, you know, on a runner and he's looking down at the thing, and Quincy, as you know, has a runner a very, is like a carpet. Yeah, right? a runner carpet. Yeah. yeah, and and as you know, Quincy has a very unique walk, one of the coolest walks I've ever seen. And he doesn't put it on; it's just him. So he's walking down. I went, oh man, this is so cool. He's looking down, <laughs> and and he looks up, and there's a glass door, and he goes, comes to the door. He said, "You're Tommy Baylor." And I said, yes. He said, you're not white. <laughs> Did he really think you? That's what it, I'm telling you exactly his words. <laughs> you're not white. And I said, I am what I am. Yeah. And he says, come on in. Well, normally when you go to someone's home, especially if it's a business deal, you start off in the living room. It's formal, it's relaxed. He took me right into the kitchen. And we're sitting there in the kitchen within 10 minutes. We are brothers. And I said, hey, man, do you wake up in the middle of the night with tunes going through your head? He said, all the time. I said, do you write them down? He said, hell yeah. Otherwise, I'll go to Mancini's house. <laughs> that's Quincy. And that's not a joke. That's just him, you know? Before and they then, leave. And then he said, hey, man, I loved your charts. I'm doing this new album. It's different than anything I've done. And I just love your work. And so he hired me as a vocal arranger. The first song I did for him was Everything Must Change. 
And and it was so beautiful. Classic. It was so and and uh, Bernard, you know, the who wrote it and sang it. Beautiful, beautiful man. And his voice was extraordinary. Everything was changed. You know? And I've got my group, I think it was uh, two girls, three guys. And when I heard his song, and then he breaks it down and all of a sudden you go, goes into a groove and you got Rossellino on the, I mean the whole, it was such a beautiful. Frank Rossellino. It was a masterpiece. And the first thing Trombone I thought player. of as a vocal arranger, stay out of the way. So uh, my vocal arrangement on that is all unison. And it's singing with him or answering him or, but it was, there's not a harmony part in that vocal. So your, your big first arranging job with Quincy Jones and you knew that you had to do the minimum. You had to do the minimalist well, approach, right? You say Because it no. was the right approach. You say no, I, this is where I'm not gonna correct you, but I'm just saying how I see it. For me, those things come to me and I say yes. This is what I learned from my dad. If it feels good, say yes. And I'm listening to this thing and I'm going, this is a masterpiece. Nobody has heard it, you know? And, and everybody knows it's a masterpiece now, but when you're in, in that beautiful place and I thought, what are you going to do with this? And the answer was stay out of the way. And by doing that, you highlight what's there. It kind of just supports. I mean, and you're giving me the result. I don't think about that. But you're right. You're right. But I think you, you, I have a feeling that you create the same way. Once I get the permission or once I've accepted that I'm saying yes to it, the world opens up to me and I listened. You know, my dad said, you never have to search, man. You don't have to search. Listen to what? Your inside, your heart, yeah. your mind, the combination thereof. And if you go, well, that can't happen. Well, you just well, it. You know, because it comes to you from <laughs> above, you know, from out there. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of what you said about uh, Quincy saying then it'll go to Mancini's house because I, I, I think that Quincy believed that it, it came as a gift. From, oh, it does. And then you got to accept that gift or it'll, it'll move. It'll, it'll be out there somewhere else, you know? That's kind of the, the, the way these like masters, they often have that similarity. You know, that when Da Vinci died, you know Michael was a Da Vinci scholar. You told me that. He I know more know about Da Vinci. We used to get, cause I read Isaacson's thing and I'm a, a huge Da Vinci fan. I mean, you look up in an encyclopedia who, who created the parachute and it was Da Vinci in the 15th century, 16th century. You know, well, even the helicopter. Well, which that's there the isn't point. even one. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, like, and, but you know what these were? I what I loved about Da Vinci is because I got into production, live big productions, like the Super Bowl, like Radio City Music Hall. You know, I I don't know how I ended up there. I didn't set up to say I want to go there. Yeah. But it came my way, and I went, yeah. You know, and 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 he produced these big shows for these wealthy men and kings. And, and that's where he drew, the helicopter didn't fly, the parachute didn't work, he just put them in the show. And that's what his, that's what he saw, that's what he drew. And yet later on, they actually made that stuff. Isn't that great? <laughs> the dream happened. That's the point. Happened first. It's always a dream. You know, Tom is the one that introduced the Sinclair to Quincy and Michael. Mm -hmm. But we haven't really, we, we just touched on how you met Quincy. And we haven't touched at all on how you met Michael because I understand oh, cool. you knew Michael before. So what do you think is I the knew next? Quincy. I knew Michael before Quincy. We want to get the whole story and Tom was there. And Tom knows a lot of the background stuff that happened on a lot of the songs that are on Thriller. So and I'll tell you if, I mean, it's, uh, it's up to you, but you told me how you met Michael. I was this beautiful story. And I'm gonna tell you my beautiful story about how I met Michael. Because when Motown came west in 72, they were looking for black arrangers, especially vocal arrangers. And they actually wrote, they, there was also an ad in the paper. We're looking for black 
vocal arrangers. <laughs> and my brother I and I show <laughs> up at their office and they're like, are you in the right suite? We said, well, you said you wanted some black arrangers. And they said, yeah, yeah, <laughs> that's what we want. And we had some cassettes. We said, here, listen to those. And they listened to those. And they said, okay, you're on. That was, it. That was the end of it. <laughs> the it was no spoke. big deal. Okay. You know, so now I get a call. Oh, their orchestrator, his name escapes me, one of the best orchestrators on the West Coast for Motown ever. And black, beautiful, beautiful man. We'll think of his name and we can put it in there later. But anyway, what I loved about, uh, I was raised with music, with, with orchestral, as well as singing voices. And a lot of musicians go, well, they're a singer. They're, no, they're not a musician. And those are the people that I'm going to take in the back of the bar. But um, what... What I realize is I, and is that some of the greatest orchestrators didn't, they were immersed in the orchestra and the colors there. They didn't really get to the vo vocals no. or something you did later. No. And it wasn't that they were downgrading them. A lot of times they did, but I think it was just something to talk they about. They didn't have the experience because they yeah. were spending the, so much time on the other stuff, exactly. on the instrumental music. You know, What's important, the violins or a couple of singers? So, so they, they uh, but the wonderful thing about this fellow, we would do these dates and his vocal parts were atrocious. Well, we're not there to tell anybody there is atrocious, we're there to fix it. Mm -hmm. So I would go to him uh, and say, hey man, this chart is killer, but I've got some ideas vocally, he says, please, Please. So we go back and we say, okay, do this, do this, do this. He'd be thrilled. And, and then he finally calls me and he says, hey, man, from, out, from now on, I'm just going to have them hire you as a vocal arranger. Motown. I, yeah, or whoever I work but with. But this started through the Motown. It started with Motown. Connection. And, <clears throat> excuse me. And I get a call from him not long after that. He said, Michael's doing his first, his first uh, single album. It's called Music and Me, We Think. And, um, and I want you to do the vocal arrangements. And I said, oh, great, man. And, and um, I knew them through AB. I mean, I knew them off the records. Wonderful. And, uh, you knew the Jacksons like, from, yeah, their, from their hits. Well, they were Jackson 5 yeah, then. Right. Yeah, and, and he, anyway, he said, uh, and the first song you're going to know, the first song that we're recording with him is Too Young. That, uh, that was, you know, recorded by Nat King Cole in the 50s. It was a huge hit. And I said, oh, my God. Michael's going to sing that. And I, so, okay, fine. Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> then he sends me a demo and I hear this kid's voice and I got tears in my eyes. Uh, yeah. They said he was 11, but he was 13 years old. Uh -huh. How could he have lived long enough yeah. to even understand what this is about? So that was my first right. feeling. Yeah. So, but I did the chart and, uh, and the one thing that uh, the composer... The arranger's name almost came to you. He says, oh, the one thing is, he said, I know that you would normally use your singers, but because this is first Michael's break away from the family, mm -hmm. the brothers are a little nervous. And they were hoping that they could be the background group. Well, they didn't really sing in tune, but I said, yeah, but that doesn't matter. The, what matters is keeping them happy, right? And I said, oh, yeah, we'll do it. So this guy calls and says, I want you to, uh, did the vocal arrangement is going to be for the boys. And um, I said, okay, fine. So I got there. If I was arranging, mm -hmm. I always got there at least an hour. And I, and I think I speak for all of us. If, if, if I have something to do with the production, I'm there an hour early. Yeah. I want to be relaxed and all ready for them to come in. And also the other thing I didn't do at that time, and again, I think I speak for most of us, is that I would never introduce myself to the artist. 
I would have the producer introduce me to the audience, to the, the to the artists. So I saw the brothers. I walked into Motown. The brothers are in the lounge, and they're just hanging out, and they're nice kids. I don't even say hi to them. They're busy. So I walk into the studio, and, and um, the studio's dark, but the only light's coming from the booth, and they're getting the tapes ready, you know? Yeah. So I set up. I've got my little thing with me, and I just uh, double-checking my charts and all of the stuff that I'm doing, just getting all comfortable. And all of a sudden, I see the light come in as this door opens into the studio, the big studio. Uh -huh. And in Lumber is a teenager. Lumbers? Lumber. Yeah, this is what blow me away. He's, I look up and I see this typical teenage dude, you know, walks like this. And as he walks into the studio, he doesn't see me. My eyes are on him because if he sees me, I want, then I'm going to have to introduce myself. But he can't see me because I'm actually in a corner. He's walking in this way. But I got my eyes on him. Now, as he walks in, he starts lumbering in as a child, a, you know, a, a, like a, a lanky lanky teenager uh -huh. and and he starts walking for this the nine foot you know piano which is covered with a soft cover yeah. and as he walks over i see i keep my eyes on his eyes to see if they're going to look at me and and as i i see a difference where he is now going somewhere else and his walk changes from a lumber to almost like gliding. And he walks over to the piano and, and in, in the waist of the piano, he just leans on it and he's looking out in the space and I still have my eyes on him. And he starts to sing, climb every mountain. And I was mesmerized. I'd never heard a singer. He was a thousand years old. I'm in shock right now hearing this. This is why I wanted to share this with you. And it just mesmerized me. I thought, oh my God, I am in the midst of royalty. I mean, not just royalty, but I mean, of God, you know, I mean, and not God, because, you know, I mean, I don't want to get anything started there, but I'm just saying, it was unbelievable what I was seeing and he never did see me now pretty soon the lights go on in the studio he sings it for only 20 30 seconds and i'm mesmerized then all of a sudden the lights go on the door is open the brothers come in and we go to work i told michael about that later well, when did you get introduced to him well because that that's when when the lights went on the group came in so did the so did i think the it was producer. hal davis i think it was hal davis the producer came in and said hey tommy baylor is doing your arrangements today but like he told that to michael no years later no but that day how did you get introduced to michael oh well the 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 the, the when the boys came in so did the producer and it was just that fast. Yeah, and they didn't see me at first because I was in a corner getting my work together. I just wanted to make sure, right? What we oh, always do. And then do. you just did your thing. So you just observed all of that happening. I saw all of that with being invisible to him. So there was nothing, nobody watching him, but I got to see this. How did that change what was going on you from the moment you walked into the studio compared to after you experienced that moment with Michael observing him? to starting the gig now you're did that did what was going on inside you i i put it in a room because now i was going to work but i never forgot that moment as i'm explaining it to you well you had to know that you were dealing with something different oh than... yeah but the point is that wasn't what i was here for because his voice his voice was already on it yeah I and see. because his brother was going to sing in the group he was going to sing in the group too so he became my soprano you know oh so the basic tracks were down already oh the basic tracks were down his lead was down and i don't think they changed it and so, so you're overdubbing the arrangement right oh yeah we're all we we always did vocals last because well, let's get that in perspective because everybody oh, yeah, doesn't always absolutely. know that well you know when i first got in the business we were still recording 
with the orchestra, well, what we used to do for Johnny Mathis at Columbia. The orchestra was there, and there were some gobos, and the singers were there, and they gave the downbeat. We recorded it. Everybody. We went home. Yeah. You know what I mean? Right. And, and that was fine. That was the way music was made. Mm-hmm. Why not? Right. And then when, but that was before we got into multiple tracks. Yeah. And when multiple tracks came in, they said, well, wait a minute. You know, we could save so much money. We're sitting there paying the singers, and they'd come in and sing at six bar, bars, yeah. you know, or whatever. Or we can bring in the, we can get more, um, um, we can se- get better set- separation if we don't yeah. do strings and brass at the same time. And more focus. And, and, and I mean, it grew. The business grew. Mm-hmm. And it was kind of fun, you know, because it really made things different and sonically, and it, it was cool. So... Um, so we were doing the voices. Everything was there. The only people in the studio were the brothers, and and in the booth was the producer, and me in there with the brothers singing in their parts, you know. And because see, I love the fact that singers don't read, um, and they don't read as well. Um, I had a professor once tell me that a violinist will see more notes in the overture to Figaro that a singer will ever see in his entire life. (laughs) And it makes sense. Because singers are emoting from their bodies. The rest of us, I was a trumpet player, Mm -hmm. you know, or at the parent, we are all creating something, you know? But this is the body. And so we sing the thing and it goes great, but I never forgot that moment. I mean, it struck me so hard as I'm explaining it to you, I'm back there right now, you know, uh, just trying to stay out of his way. I just, my, my concern at the time was if, if he looks at me, I don't want him to be surprised there's some guy in the studio, you know, that was really what was on my mind. But in the meantime, he, he impressed me in a way that I, I still can't explain. Well, where did it go from there then? Did you well, we did the gig and it was great. And then Michael was happy. Oh, yeah. Well, Michael didn't have a say. Yeah, but he still was no, logging he, things in his mind well, for the future. Possibly, but he didn't talk he to always, us about but it. Of course, you know he always does. Oh, absolutely. He's I mean, a computer. That, I had just met him. No, he was <clears throat> so polite. And, and besides, he was in the group now. He wasn't thinking about that singer. So what was the next Michael individual experience you had? Uh, oh, my God. So many of them. Um, You've done how many songs with Michael? I never counted though. Did you count your d- dates? <laughs> did you count your gigs or the songs that you did? I have no clue. But I could look back and start counting. I mean, well, yeah, but let's but put that's, it, just give, give us a perspective. That's for somebody else to do. For me, to me, I'm just here. Uh, okay. Uh, uh, on that album, and then subsequent albums. Uh, Over twenty. Oh yeah, and and then <clears throat> and then my brother, because my brother was always on dates with me, and my brother, I got my brother into the business. My brother bought me into the business, so we were the Baylor brothers, you know. And that's how we kind of made our thing, because we had something fresh, and and also we were we were very educated, as you were. You know what I mean? Well, and you. and no, that, but- mat- that matters to a producer because they know that there aren't going to be, as Quincy calls it, no Amaras on the gig. Amara, what are we going to do now? Um, uh, no, uh, you know? Yeah. Well, he, uh, and you guys were like bringing a whole new level to vocals that hadn't been there. You know, that, that's the thing. We didn't know that. And then you can put <laughs> that into the setting of because you already had a whole new level of music going on inside you. Yes. So you were able to put that together in a way that no one else really could before. Yes, but my brother and I, we didn't think about it because it's who we were. Like, you don't think about it either, I don't think. You just walk in there, you do what you do, you care. I was thrilled to be there. I love the singers I work with. I love the bands I love. With. And the artists didn't matter. I never judged the artists. I'm not here to judge the artists. I'm here to bring something a, a new sonic addition. Yeah. Well, they they embraced it, and then so you you worked. Did you continue working with the Jacksons? Mm. More Jacksons albums. Oh yeah. And then when my then, Jackson Five then so, I start to 
I hate to correct you, but they were Jackson Five till they left Motown. Okay. When they left Motown, Barry, Barry, who was a mentor to, he used to take Michael to dinner when he was 11 years old because he soaked up every, he asked questions, odd infinitum. And Michael asked Barry questions? And he would write it down. He carried a, a yellow legal pad with him. Michael did, at dinner. At dinner, to when, when, <clears throat> when Diana Ross would take him, because this is going off track for a minute, but you know, well, Barry Gordy didn't. Track. Okay, Barry didn't want to sign. He knew how good they were, the, the Jackson Five, but he said, we're not signing them. He already had Stevie Wonder. It was a pain in the ass. Not that they are a pain in the asses, but because of the laws, you have to have teachers, you have to have people oh, there. For the you Jackson know, I mean, Five. just so, so it, com it complicates your business so much. And he thought it's not worth it. So finally, he went, oh, I, it is worth it, you know? So, so, so he brings the family out, and they're pretty rough, you know? I mean, all the boys, are the whole family is lovely people. And Joe was not the enemy. He was harsh. He was harsh. That was, but he loved the boys. There would be no Jackson 5. There would be no Michael Jackson without Joe Jackson because he was a, kind of a half-assed guitar player that had dreams, but he didn't have the time, client. But when he saw it in his kids, mm -hmm. he gave them what he could give them. And when they signed with Motown, they locked him out because he was harsh. And he goes, no, 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 like, like that, you know? And he used to take the belt, belt to Michael because he'd say, sing it this way. And Michael said, no, the youngest one. No, Dan. You I, saw that? This is, I read about it and talked to Michael about it. Yeah. Did you know Joe? Oh, yeah. You uh, saw him at... Oh, you want to hear a Joe story? So when we record She's Out of My Life, you know, we always did talk about Polaroids. The first recording that we do, we're at Alan Zentz, right? We got the track, which is just the piano. Michael sings it. We put it on cassette. We go home. We all listen to it. Everybody on the team, you know, Quincy, uh, Bruce, Swedeen, and me at that point, that was just the three of us. And we listened to it and say, what would I change? What would I change? And we go back <laughs> and, and I get a call that night because obviously Michael took it too, right? Takes it home and Joe, he says, uh, I get this voice. He says, Tommy Baylor. I said, yeah. He said, uh, this is Joe Jackson. I said, oh, hi, Mr. Joe. You can call me Joe. Thank you. Um, that song that Michael cut, uh, called today, what is it, Out of My Life or something? <laughs> he said, I just want you to know it's not going to be on the album. I said, oh, oh. Um, interesting. He says, yeah, well, it can be on the album if I own the publishing. That's the only way. I said, uh, Joe, I'll get back to you. So I hang up, call Quincy. Heard from Joe. He said he wants to publish it. <laughs> Quincy. I said, yeah. He said, Nat, I'll take care of it. Okay? So he calls Joe. And he said, Joe, Tommy Baylor just called and said that the song was, uh, wasn't going to be on the album because you, you, you didn't you don't own the publishing, and the publishing's not available, so we're gonna take it off the album. It's, it's not gonna be on the album. And Joe goes, whoa, 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 wait a minute, wait a minute. What are you talking about not gonna be on the album? Man, I didn't say that to, oh, Tommy got it wrong. Tommy got it wrong. And he said, well, so you're saying that it's okay. Oh, it's, oh yeah, everything's fine, man. He's a paper tiger. But he did his best. You know, he wasn't an idiot. He just wasn't, he, also, he, he, he wasn't experienced. He didn't get it, you know? I mean, he drove a truck at, at a, at a, in a, in a, in a, uh, in a steel mill. Yeah. You know? And, 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 and he, and he was a failure as a player. So there was a lot of frustration in it. And he was trying to get some power.
And, but you know what? We learned how to deal with Joe. And that's what Motown did, man. Barry Gordy said he is not allowed in the studio because he's an interruption. Not because we don't like him, but he, he has an effect on the boys that we don't want to have. We want them to be free and to be who they are. So it was handled beautifully. And nobody hated anybody. And, and, and when I first saw, besides that first time I heard him sing, which put him on just a whole, and he's never left that angel, <laughs> you know, that angel height. Uh, they used to come over, we'd have them for about an hour and a half. Uh, they'd pick him up from school in a limousine, bring him to Motown Studios. And uh, I was always there early, because I'm right, right? And I'm sitting there and the car comes in and all the boys get out of the car, and it's a big limo. Um, all the boys get out of the car. Michael gets out, and he looks across the street at Poinsettia Park, and he sees everybody playing in the park, and he starts crying. He didn't see me again, but I saw this, and it just broke my heart. Um, I would have been thrilled to go into the studio. <laughs> you know, he wanted to go play with the kids. Yeah. And so that was, those were my experiences that uh, I adored Michael. I think we all did. He was, um, he was just such a special being. It's, you can't categorize him at all, except that he was always always surprised you and there was a time well over the years my brother and i became his basic most trusted vocal arrangers and i loved that and and i always when he did interviews it thrilled me he says and my friend tommy baylor wrote she's out of my life i said i'm his friend 